Well, this is number three of Judgment Has Begun. Num judgment Has Begun. Number three. Last week we looked at we are a covenant nation. No doubt about that. A covenant was made by John Winthrop, by the Puritans. God directed the Puritans to come here. This was his will that they come here. They were following him and were brought to this land and established this land as a place of religious freedom. There's no doubt about that. You cannot rewrite that history, okay? You'd have to erase history to rewrite that history. And so a covenant was made in the early days that this would be a nation who would be formed after the nation Israel and would follow God. We asked the question last week is what has America done since the shaking of 9-11? Again, you'll have to watch the previous two. I'm not going to reteach those. But quickly, since 9-11, uh, we have been looking at Isaiah 9-10. Will you turn there with me? Isaiah 9-10 is the key passage if we read 9.10, Isaiah 9.10, it says, The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with smooth stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. This is the passage that seems to be the most indicative prophecy of the time. Yeah, a couple of them. This seems to be the most indicative prophecy of the time that fits our, our situation. All right, Isaiah 9, 10. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with smooth stones or hewn stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedar. Seems to be one of the key passages for this particular time. This is one of the passages that was on my heart back at the uh, in November of last year that I could not get away from this particular passage over and over and over again. And I could see the immediate significance of 9-11. That was pretty hard to miss that when I was looking at this particular passage. Uh, and again, this is when things started to come together. And we learned that uh, the fallen bricks we will rebuild, the hewn stones, the cut sycamore trees, replaced with cedars, and the very vow itself were indicative of something very important. But every one of these six points seemed to have been fulfilled in 9-11 and in Israel. That as they were fulfilled in Israel, they were fulfilled in, in America. And then we uh, look at Isaiah 9, 8, 14 and say, the problem is, everyone's quoting 9, 10 saying, we're going to come back bigger and stronger than ever before. But they're missing the fact that Isaiah 9, 8 through 14 is a curse upon the land. That this is not a blessing of strength. This is a curse of man trying to do it without God. So every time a politician quotes 9-10, they're pronouncing a curse upon the nation. Are they doing it on purpose? Of course they're not doing it on purpose. But are, are, are they being used as a harbinger, as a truth teller, as a warning of the future? Yes, I believe that it is not coincidence that this has happened. I don't believe that at all. I think that this is in the hand of God and in the will of God as a warning warning to us. So we start again in Isaiah 9.10. We have another couple of things we need to say about Isaiah 9.10 before we move on. The first thing that I want to say is the beam. The beam. We said that Isaiah 9.10 basically says that this is a time of remembrance, this is a time of rebuilding, and that we will build stronger, but it is without God's help. This is in the strength of man. That the terrorists have done this to us in New York City, and by golly, we're going to come back stronger than ever before. Just watch us. And we have become more and more secular and less and less godly, and God is not given a role in this judgment. We are not looking and saying, should we be getting, I mean, as some get our attention? Should we be looking? We're not seeing this as the shaking that it is, but instead we have come back with this vow of defiance before the judgment of God. If 9-11 was the beginning of judgment, if it was, now it depends on you to determine whether or not you think it was or not, okay? If you don't think it was, then you go about your business. If it was, then we need to start paying attention. All right? And so, with it being that way, we come back and say that if we look at remembrance, rebuild, and build stronger, 8-2 8 8 of 12, President Obama visited the World Trade Center before it was completely through. And he signed a beam that was going to be used in the top construction of the World Trade Center, the new uh, one center. He signed a beam that had been painted stark white, brilliant white, and he used a red Sharpie pen. Now, of all the things that the president could have written, of all the things that he could have written on that particular beam, as he signed it, this is what he wrote. We remember, we rebuild we come back stronger. 
What a coincidence, huh? What a coincidence, as we uh, say tongue-in-cheek. That during this particular time, our president, once again, one more time, as others had done before him, pronounced this judgment from Isaiah, and it is in the actual building that was being built. It's actually written in the girders and the foundation of the building that was built. Pretty soon, you just got to take attention to some of this stuff. Even if you don't grab every one of these uh, seven points, something's got to get your attention somewhere. Okay? There's one last thing about Isaiah 9.10 that I want you to understand. When you look at Isaiah 9.10, there's actually a reference to the Tower of Babel in Isaiah 9.10. When it says, the bricks have fallen, we will rebuild with hewn stones, the sycamores have been cut down. The first two lines of that, the first two lines actually refer to the Tower of Babel. Because when we see it in Hebrew, 9.10 says, The bricks are fallen down, but let us come build for ourselves a tower. And what did we read in Genesis 11? Let's go back and look. Genesis 11. Genesis 11 verse 3 says, They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly, that they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. We have the mentioning of bricks, we have the mentioning of stone, we have the mentioning of rebuilding, we have the mention of tower. And remember the root, the word for tower is migdal, and the root is gadal, which means haughty, arrogant, or proud. And so in this very building of Genesis, uh, the Tower of Babel, we have a reference in Isaiah that this is referring to the haughty, proud tower of Babel. I want to go back to something here that we just kind of went by. When we looked at the president, I want you to understand that the sign in front of him says, One World Center. That's the name of the building. One World Center. And what was it that we read in Genesis 11 about the Tower of Babel? Let us be one world in one language. Again, you got to shake your head sometime. <laughs> you got to say, this is piling up. This is starting to pile up. The evidence is getting stronger and stronger. So there's actually a reference to the Tower of Babel in Isaiah 9. And here we are building this tower to make one world center. Now, I'm not going to get off into the one world government, trial, uh, unilateral commission, and the you know, all that stuff. You can go there if you want to, the Illuminati and things. All I know is I'm more concerned about the judgment of God than I am some imaginary or real group that's ruling things because they aren't ruling anything. The people that look towards these committees and stuff like that, God bless you. I am not criticizing you, but I am telling you that they are not bigger than my God. They think they may be ruling the world, but my God is taking care of what He wants done when He wants it done. They may be a tool of his, but I'm not going to study the tool. I'm going to study the carpenter. Yes. Amen? Yes. All right. So, again, I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss or, or, or downplay anything, but let's keep our eyes on what we need to keep our eyes on, and let's not get out of focus, okay? Let's keep the focus where it needs to be. Well, I want to remind you that on 9-11, then, this Tower of Babel, was built or, or came down that it came down and we rebuilt again and that we had flight 11 right we talked about flight 11 how one to seven was very important in the in this scripture and in this judgment that one will fly will you know send them to flight and seven will send ten thousand to flight what a what a strange number why would it be one and seven well seven is the perfect number okay and so the perfect number can send even more to flight we looked at that already but I also remind, remind you that the Tower of Babel is in the 11th chapter of Genesis. And Genesis being the first book, folks, that means that it's actually the 11th chapter in the Bible. It's the 11th chapter in the whole cotton pig of Bible. Not just the book of Genesis. And so again, this 11 becomes incredibly prophetic.
and becomes a part of the weaving of the tapestry of what's going on in this judgment that we're experiencing. Gary Maslin was a photographer in New York City who was taking pictures of the destruction of the, of the towers before any of the crews could really get in there and do what they needed to be done. Gary was trying to get as many pictures before the crews got tearing things stuff apart so that in case it could be used for evidence or whatever. He who has been very famous for photojournalism and things like that in the New York City area. And he began to take pictures. And some of the pictures that Gary Mazin took have become incredibly famous. In fact, this photograph is in the museum of the One World Center. Because in the midst of the debris, he saw some torn pages from a Bible. The entire Bible was not there, but about four or five scattered pages were there. Only one of them was very legible. The rest of them, according to his book that he wrote, um, were charred and torn. But there was one page that he took a picture of that was almost completely intact. And this is Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, was in the destruction. God saying, hello. Anybody home? Hello? Yeah. Uh, they have looked for that Bible and it was scooped up and taken away, but the picture still remains. And the pictures uh, are dated and uh, GPS locked. They were digital camera. And it is uh, from the bomb site. It is from that area. And uh, there's no doubt about it. And to the point where it's actually, you can see the caption on the side, says the Ground Zero Bible page, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babylon. And that is taken from the museum. <coughs> the picture is in the One Trade Center Museum. No doubt about it. No questions about it. All right, now we kind of leave Isaiah 9 alone. I have eight things that came out of Isaiah 9, right? Eight things that were parallels to the children of Israel to the to the United States. Now we go on to a ninth thing that is really stands on its own, but it is another prophecy, and that is the withering. The withering of trees has always been um, indicative of judgment. The withering of a tree always was a sign of judgment. So let's go to Psalm 37, please. Psalm 37, a new, a new prophecy, a new judgment that has been fulfilled. Psalm 37, 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 37, 1, 2, and 3 says, Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards wrongdoers, for they will quickly wither. Yeah, they'll wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. That's what we're supposed to do, but when the evildoers are in control, things are going to wither and things are going to fade. Is there any doubt about what it's saying for us? Look at Isaiah 130. Isaiah 130. Isaiah 130 is a judgment chapter. This is, he is giving judgment to Israel. It says, For you will be like an oak whose leaf fades away, it withers, or as a garden that has no water. Judgment judgment. Withering and dryness is a part of judgment. Look at Jeremiah 8, 12 and 13. Jeremiah 8, 12 and 13. Again, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, crying for uh, the people of God and what was going to happen. Were they ashamed because the abomination that they had done? They certainly were not ashamed. And did they not know how to blush? Boy, wouldn't, isn't that a good question for America today? We have totally forgotten to blush, how to blush. I mean, we are nasty, nasty people. That's all there is to it. Our country has gotten dirty, nasty. And there's no blushing whatsoever. I, I tell you that in the 16 years I've been teaching young adults, the mouths of the women that I teach have exceeded the mouths of the men that I teach. And the violence in high school, 80% of the fights in schools that create, uh, create damage that has to be hospitalized is female. Girl on girl fights, 80%. 80%. You've come a long way, baby. Good job. 
Good job. Yeah, you finally caught up to the idiots of men. Uh, that's real evolution, isn't it? You know. But were they ashamed because of the abomination they'd done? They certainly were not ashamed, and they did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be brought down, says the Lord. They shall fall among those who fall. Is they shall wither among the tall trees or the trees that stand. And so we have a withering in Jeremiah. Look at Ezekiel 17. I mean, I'm just trying to show you that prophet after prophet after prophet uses this as a symbol of destruction. Ezekiel 17 verses 8, 9, and 10. Ezekiel 17, 8, 9, and 10 says... It was planted in good soil beside abundant waters that it might yield branches and bear fruit and become a splendid vine. That's the nation of Israel. That's America. We were planted in good soil with you know everything we needed to grow. Everything that we needed, okay? And so 8 says, To bear fruit and become a splendid vine. 9. Say, Thus says the Lord God, Will it thrive? Will it not pull up its roots? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers so that all its sprouting leaves wither and there and neither by great strength nor by any people can it be raised from its roots again behold though it is planted will it thrive will it not completely wither as soon as the east wind strikes it wither on the beds where it grew i think ezekiel wanted you to get the word wither in there <laughs> Don't you? Kind of wanted to push that point so that we get it and we got it. Look at Matthew 21. We know this story pretty well, don't we? It's one of them New Testament stories we're pretty comfortable with. Matthew 21, verse 19. 18 says, Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. He found no fruit on the tree whatsoever. Will he find the same when he comes to America? All leaves and no fruit. All show and no go. What is the fruit of America when it comes to God? Do we even have a fruit? I mean, we'd be lucky to find a raisin on the tree or the vine, one little old puny raisin out there. When the Lord comes along and says, I'll spare you for ten people, I hope he finds us. Yes. Amen? Amen? Because it's getting fewer and farther between, folks. Churches are turning their back and no longer proclaiming evil as evil. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> no longer shall there be any fruit from you and at once the fig tree judgment judgment on the tree withering is a part of the judgment we talked about the sycamore dying and the pine tree being put in the northern spruce was put in and it was called the tree of hope for some reason, three years after that tree was planted, an amazing almost three and a half years, three and a half years later, that tree began to die. And that tree did die. New York City and the National Park Service spent $1.7 million trying to keep that tree alive. They put new dirt around it. They put food around it. They put a sprinkler system in it. They did testing of the leaves and they did testing of the branches. They did testing of the bark and they did testing of the heart of the tree. And to this day today in 2020, no one knows why that tree died. There is no scientific medical reason for that tree to have died. But it did. And in fact, to cover the fact that the tree was dying, they planted 21 shrubs from the corner of the street leading up to that tree so that there would be some greenery along the walkway because the tree was dying. The three shrubs that are closest to the tree died. And all the rest survived. And yet they can find nothing in the ground. But that which was close to the curse received the curse. The tree will wither and dry. And what did we call it? The tree of hope. America's hope. 
Our hope is in thee, O Lord. In Christ, your only hope of glory, Galatians tells us. Our only hope of glory is in Christ in us. And yet we're trying to do it on our own. Folks, it's not that the tree died, but the tree is a symbol. It's a symbol of the decay, the rot, the disease, and the death in a nation that no longer honors God. It is a symbol of the death in our country. And it died. And it withered. There are many others. There are lots of others in books and elsewhere. And, uh, but I'm trying to stay as close to what the Lord showed me as I possibly can. And so I think it's time that we turn towards what were the causes of destruction. What happened that created these destructive forces in the land? What is it that made God begin to judge us? And why did it happen? One of the causes of destruction in the Bible is the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think that there's any question that this is biblical. I don't think that there's any question that this happened. You can call the Bible as much a myth as you want to, but it doesn't make it a myth. You can call it what you can call it a lie and you can call it outdated, but that don't make it so. Okay? When we look at Genesis 18, let's go to Genesis 18. I want to remind you that going back seven years in our history, seven years in the history of Grace Bible Church, we were praying on Sunday mornings that the courts and the laws would not make it illegal to preach in this pulpit the truth. I went to seminars and read things online about what I should do should I be arrested for preaching against homosexuality in the pulpit because it was hate speech and I could be held accountable for that speech in the pulpit. Do you remember that? I mean, we were praying, God, don't let this pass. Don't let this happen. Don't let people be jailed for this. This was not a shadow of a problem. This was a looming problem under an administration and a leadership that thought they were doing a good thing. But they were doing the unbiblical thing. And they were following man and not God. And we shook our heads and said, how could the country turn around so fast? How could we lose some control so fast? How could the enemy get such a grasp on our country so quickly? How could the nuts be driving the bus and the, uh, the, you know, the patients running the asylum? How in the world could this happen in one term? How could this happen so quickly with one administration? How could it have changed so much? How quickly can things turn around? when God's in control. We haven't even had a second administration and things have already turned around. And I can stand here and preach without any fear whatsoever what is in my Bible. No fear whatsoever about what I say that is scriptural and biblical. None. God can turn things around. But if we're looking at Genesis 18, this is the birth of Isaac promised. This is when Isaac is being uh, promised to Abram and to Sarah. And we know that the two men come and we have uh, all of this uh, uh, covenant being said that, yeah, you're going to be pregnant. <laughs> Sarah's laughing in the tent. And she says, I, I, <laughs> I didn't laugh. And God says, you did too that you are going to be a covenant people. Do you understand that Genesis 18 is the creation of the people of Israel as the children of God? Folks, remember, 
I, you know, I, I said that covenants a couple of weeks ago and in our teaching that if you're, milita if you're artillery, then you're going to cut your arm. If you're cavalry, you're going to cut your leg. If you make a covenant with God with your children, you're going to be circumcised because what, you know, the part that's important is where you shed the blood. And so what's important for the propagation of children but circumcision. That's why we circumcise because it's the blood covenant between God and man that our children will be your children. Our nation will be your nation. That's what it's all about. And so here we establish a blood covenant with God, with Abram, that he's going to fulfill the covenant of chapters before when they walked through the meat, and we talked about this on Wednesday night, that now this is going to happen. And in the same chapter where family and where tradition and where marriage and childbearing is the most important thing in the covenant, the two men leave and go to Sodom. Same chapter. Same chapter. Do you think those angels just had spare time and thought they'd wander down there? Do you think they said, oh, thank goodness we got, rid of, we got done with that Abraham Sarah thing a little quick. Let's go, let's go down to the beach for a while. Let's go hang out at the Dead Sea. You know, you can't sink. Oh, I know that. I'm an angel. I can't sink. And so they just wandered down that way. It is a part of the exact same passage. Verse 16 of 18 says, Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. God has established the fact that family and children and everything is going to be His way to fulfill this. And then they went to where it's not being fulfilled. Again, no coincidence. Come on, put two and two together. This is the way it's written. This is what God's trying to tell us. And they went off to Sodom. Look at verses 17 to 21. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? You see, the fate of Sodom was sealed. When he, was doing the, when he was doing the covenant with Abraham and he was telling him that you're going to have a kid in a year, this was a done deal. Being at Abraham was just to stop off on the way where they were going. To stop off on the way. Okay? Sodom was not an afterthought. Abraham was on the way. And so, we read, since Abraham, uh, am I, should I hide from him what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation. What does it mean? You're going to have more kids than you count. And in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. What does that mean? All nations are going to be blessed by his children. It's going to be the fruit of his loins that have this happen. For I have chosen him so that he may command his and his Oh, it's all about kids and household. I've chosen him because of that. Now, is there any doubt why God was doing this? He spells it out. We read over it so fast we don't see it. We just read over and go, how soon? Oh, I'm going to fire a stone. And oh, and Sodom's gone. We read it so fast. Stop and smell the roses in Scripture. Why would he be bringing up his children and his household on his way to Sodom? Because again, family is what he's all about. Family is what he's all about. For I've chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he's spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I'll know. I have heard the spiritual voices. I've heard the demons. I've heard the battle. But I'm going to go look for myself. I'm going to go look for myself. Look at 19, 1 to 5. Genesis 19, 1 to 5. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. We've looked at gates, haven't we? See, he's sitting there in the gate. He's sitting there in the tower room 
When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, No, but we shall spend the night in the square. Thanks for the hospitality, but we're not here for a meal. We're here to do something. We're here to do some work. Yet he urged them strongly so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. Now, he had to be talking pretty strong to change their mind. He urged them strongly, okay? In other words, he knew what Sodom was about. No doubt. He is a wise man and an elder of Sodom sitting in the gate to pronounce judgment and to welcome people. And you know what? People who sat in the gate and welcomed people usually collected taxes. Think about it. Sitting there to take taxes. You got anything with you? You got anything on your donkey? What are you bringing in? We tax that. We don't tax that. Come on in. Welcome to town. But remember, when you leave, if you buy anything, be sure to show us. Fill out this paper while you're on the airplane before you land. Your customs, okay? So, he urged them strongly so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread and they ate. Before they laid down, That we got to sometime talk about the unleavened bread there too. Why does it mention it? Why didn't he just say he gave them bread? There's a reason. There's a reason here. He baked unleavened bread and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him. Now, is that verse plain enough? I don't have to talk about that, do I? I got kids in the room. Okay, it's all right. We understand what we say. Did you know that if you look up Sodom and Gomorrah in Wikipedia, it says that the sin of Sodom was arrogance and pride? Now, you go down about four paragraphs and it says, Christians say. But the real pride we know is arrogance. Huh? You see, that's the kind of answer you come up when you're answering questions about the Bible that you ain't read before. I can tell you all kinds of things about books I haven't read. I can be one of the smartest people in the world about books I haven't read. But that man I'm going to be right. Amen? So, they surrounded the house. That's kind of scary right there. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. There should be no question as to what the sin of Sodom was. None. Lot, the wisest man in Sodom, or one of the wisest men in Sodom, was not very bright. I mean, all you have to do is read the story of Lot and Abram and all that stuff, and he wasn't one of the smartest cookies in the jar. Okay? Abram got the brains, Lot evidently got the looks. I'm not sure what. He got something along the way. Because he even said... I have two virgin daughters I will give to the crowd and you can tear them apart and rip them to pieces if you leave these two guys alone. Can you imagine? Can you imagine saying that to a bloodthirsty, surrounded crowd who's in a frenzy? Take my daughters. Do whatever you want to. Just don't bother these two guys. That's what we're dealing with. I'm not reading arrogance and I'm not reading pride anywhere in that scripture. Look at Jeremiah 39. Now when Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Ju Judah, in the tenth month, ninth day of the tenth month. Isn't it nice of them to put those dates in there for us sometimes? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, all his army came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, Gosh, what a coincidence they put all those days in there. 
The city wall was breached. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came in, sat down at the middle gate. So they just came in, became the wise people. Um, and they give their names there, but I'm not going to say them. And all the rest of the officials of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, they fled and went out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls. And he went out toward the Arabah. That's, that's where the Dead Sea is. That's down in the hole in the ground. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. They seized him and brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Riblah, and the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on them. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. The king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah. He then blinded Zedekiah's eyes, bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. The Chaldeans also burned with fire the king's palace and the houses of the people, and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem. As for the rest of the people who were left in the city, the deserters who had gone over to him, and the rest of the people who remained, Nebuzaradan, the king of the bodyguard, carried them into exile in Babylon. We have just read the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, taken into captivity. We've just read that. The fate of Israel and the fate of Jerusalem and the temple were sealed. They were sealed on a day that the Bible actually gives us the date. Isaiah 5.20 says, we call evil good and good evil. Do you remember that passage? We looked at it. Okay, we'll just, we'll just remind ourselves of that. These people began to call evil good and good evil, Isaiah said, and that was a part of the reason that they fell. In the United States, Obergefell versus Hodges was a Supreme Court ruling that gave the fundamental right to marry guaranteed to the same-sex couples. That is the ruling that changed the law of our land where homosexual marriage is now legal. The Clintons, Bill and Hillary both, supported a movement called the Defense of Marriage Act, which made homosexual marriage illegal in the land. The Clintons helped to pass that bill to help support marriage. Obergefell and Hodges overturned the DOMA Act. They took away what the Clintons had fought hard for and turned it around. In a five to four ruling of the Supreme Court, the sanctity of marriage and family was overturned in the United States. Five for it, four again it. In one moment, this became this. Celebration. The sanctity of marriage and family. Isaiah 520, that which is good evil and evil good. That was passed on June 26, 2015. That's the 9th of Tammuz, the same day that the destruction of Israel began. The date given to us in Jeremiah is the 9th of Tammuz. That is the day that the army of Nebuchadnezzar prevailed upon Jerusalem. And it's the day that our fate began to be sealed. What have we done since 2001, 9-11? We have passed a law that says evil is good and good is evil. And you just read what God did to the Jews who lived in Jerusalem near the temple. How dare we think that we will get by any better. How dare we think. Number two is the handwriting on the wall. Do you remember? In Daniel 5, the son of Nebuchadnezzar is having a big old party. Turn to Daniel 5 with me. His name was Belshazzar. He is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And he's having himself one big party. Daniel 5 1 says, Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. He was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple. 
which was in Jerusalem, so that the kings and his nobles, wives and concubines, might drink from the holy sacred vessels. They brought out the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, wives and concubines, drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone. In other words, they worshipped their gods as they got drunk in our holy vessels. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand in the plaster wall in the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him. He called everyone nearby to say, What does this mean? What does this mean? Nobody could tell him what it means. One of his wives said, Hey, there's a dude we got in captivity out there, and he seems to be pretty good with dreams and interpretation. His name is Daniel. We need to grab Daniel. We need to see what's going on. Verse 17 says, Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. In other words, give somebody who cares, because I don't. However, I will read the inscription of the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the most high God, granted sovereign grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur that he bestowed, he lived a good life. But you, look what you're doing with the temple stuff, and look what you're doing. You're proud, you behaved arrogantly. In verse 20, he goes on down to where he actually interprets the words. Verse 25. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Mini, mini, tikil, absharin. This is the interpreter of the message. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Has the handwritten handwriting been written on the wall of America? Teko, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Aries, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. The handwriting was on the wall. And so it was some of God's vessels in America today, some of those things that he uses to promote his his work and the temple, his marriage. Would you agree? Remember, marriage was established before the covenant. Marriage was established before the law. Marriage was established before sacrifice. Marriage was more important to God than all these things. They, it came first. And how about the rainbow as a covenant? This is a covenant that I will make you with you and I will put a sign in the heavens that I will never destroy the land with water again. This is my promise to you. And what has been attacked on the 9th of Tammuz in the United States? Marriage with the stolen symbol of a rainbow. And the handwriting on the wall that night, the king's palace was bathed in a message to America that God, you're not really all that relevant, and you're certainly not important. That which is evil will be seen as good, and that which is good will be seen as evil. All right, next week we'll pick up with idols. We'll pick up with idols. Let's stand together.